Okay, hello everyone, and uh, hello to Los Angeles. Um, welcome to our first ever KubeCon talk. Um, unfortunately, we cannot be with you today, so um, we sent you some uh, cold greetings from autumn in Germany, and hope you know, the weather and the, is better in in California at the moment. So let me just share my screen real quick to dive into that. So today we're going to talk about Kubernetes. What a surprise here at KubeCon. And as part of this uh, new business track, we're going to talk about our experiences in adopting Kubernetes for clients and talk about the, the hidden costs and the things that we encountered during our uh, various experiences um, in the Kubernetes journey and called it like, how free is Kubernetes really? So a few words about us. We both work at a company called, um, called Novatech um, in, in Germany. My, it's my colleague Torsten, um, who is a cloud technology consultant at Novatech. Um, we're basically both consultants in the cloud space. Torsten has a bit more focus on the side of security things. Um, I, I do also uh, give lectures at university in the, in the time when I'm not working at the company. And on a community side, I'm also engaged in the Cloud Foundry community as an ambassador and an organizer of, uh, of a meetup. So, so much for that. Um, we, before we kind of dive in into the topic, we want to give you a bit of an idea of, um, of our background. So what we do normally for, um, for a living is helping client move to the cloud uh, as, as a very generic uh, term. Um, so very often we, we support migrations from legacy uh, IT implementations to a, to a modernization level, uh, replatforming and um, making things cloud enabled and cloud native. So that comes in a kind of a flavor where we do strategic consulting, where we do hands-on implementation and migration and, and also education and, and skill enablement. So how we got to Kubernetes, um, we didn't basically go there all directly, so to say. Um, like, as you can see on the very left, the traditional things we did was um, mostly Java-based and Java enterprise-based application development, mostly in, in on-premise and, and uh, the environments in data centers. And our kind of gateway drug to the cloud was, uh, was actually Cloud Foundry. So we didn't ha have as many Cloud Foundry engagements as we do Kubernetes now, but these were like the, the first steps what we did um, of bringing workloads into like uh, in a more cloudy environment. Like nowadays, we do a lot of Kubernetes in, in both on and on off-premise um, surroundings. And um, so today we want to share a bit of our experience and, and insights, things we discovered on the way, uh, things we probably sometimes did not expect, um, and maybe give, can give you a bit of an advice um, how to move forward based on our, on our learnings. So... Yeah, I pretty much said that already, um, The why we're here today. Uh, of course, we will not only talk about technology and, and, and the costs, we also try to give a bit of a, of a business perspective. Torsten will do a bit of a deep dive into uh, some of our projects um, to see that it's, uh, we're not making this all up. It's really, it has really happened and it's still happening. Um, and, and what we took out of that. So one little disclaimer here is um, this presentation will like not provide you a, how does I say, a, a, a golden template or whatsoever or a silver bullet um, to do Kubernetes right. Um, we haven't found that yet. So in case you have, feel free to let us know. We're definitely interested in that, but we definitely had a few learnings on the way. And we hopefully can enable you to um, anticipate issues or plan better with, with the learnings that, that we can share with you. Now, to start, before we go into the projects, just like in, in a way, 
how, what our first impression was when we started with, with, with Kubernetes, especially also looking from a perspective from a, like a pass layer. Um, it's like that we were used to, we're basically coming from rather development and operation side. So we build applications, we deploy and run applications. And uh, looking at things from a past perspective, we were pretty used of like paying on a per use model, basically depending on the application or microservice, or let's say of a running container. And um, the container runtime was mostly like one big Cloud Foundry instance with, with multiple tenants. And one of the things that significantly changed there was uh, when we got into like the container as a service layer, so to say, um, that this was not the case anymore. So it, um, the, the payment uh, on, incurred from like the runtime of the underlying VMs. So um, that means we had to worry and, and plan a lot more about our utilization by ourselves. Um, and also, it was not one big Kubernetes runtime to handle them all. We very often see the situation that um, we have or managing multi, multi different, different cluster environments. So despite multi-tenancy options with, with namespaces, which we, of course, use, it's still very more the uh, a lot more the case um, that we have like different clusters for different stages to manage. So this is just like one single aspect. There will be more. I mean, some of the cost factors we're going to talk about is things like provider choice, estimation size that I already mentioned, technology evaluation and adoption, then toolings around Kubernetes for security, APM logging and tracing. And also one thing we encourage, encounter very often is, is skill enablement. So this is just a bit of a teaser. And um, with that, I will hand over to, to Torsten. Let's talk about our journey along cloud projects. We had a lot of projects and brought to you some of the most recognizable or um, the most important for us. On the next slide, we put some kind of um, time frame. Next slide, please. We started back then in 2016 with a cloud migration of a connected vehicle backend. That took a long time and was followed up by a cloud migration for a dealer platform with kind of the same technology stack. As of now, we are building a zero trust cloud platform where we will also hear a bit uh, afterwards for that. We did several cloud assessments for several projects with several uh, um, um, technology stacks. But what you also can recognize is that since 2017, we providing trainings for our customers and also for our colleagues with the things we learned along the projects and the things we did not learn, but try to get the knowledge there. Before we dive into those projects, we will Want, we want to provide a big thank you to our colleagues. Those are colleagues who are involved in this project, Adrian, Ruben, and Corvin. All of them provide their, their insights, their perceptions of the cloud adoption journey within their projects. Thank you from us to you. Let's start with mm, tales from a connected vehicle backend migration. Next slide, please. When we started into the project, the assessment was quite simple. Is there any chance for cloud for the um, old fashioned or traditional technology stack with a Java E6, traditional web sphere application server, three terabyte of data in a DB2 database backend, service oriented architecture, quarterly releases. That's probably a tech stack, which you also have in your organization or recognized from some other projects. Our customer asked, is there any chance for that stack for this application landscape to, to go into cloud? They want to have shorter release cycle. They want not so much money put into operations or um, CAPEX to OPEX migration. That's, that's what they want to do. We have been tasked to find a migration path considering refactoring versus rewrite. Is there any chance for another release cycle in the business unit? Can we have service contracts versus the old fashioned communication patterns? 
On the next slide, we will see which technology stack we found. We, we knew there is a um, migration path and we knew we need to change the runtime. Because one thing we want to use is one of the five essential characteristics of the cloud, rapid scaling. Rapid scaling is not possible with the traditional Web3 application server. We need to migrate to Web3 Liberty in this project. It, it's the very same for other technology stacks. We need some kind of cloud compatible application runtime. We need to design a new container. Uh, we need to design a container based on the official Liberty image. Um, we need to integrate old IAM systems. There are many things all around the application which has nothing to do with cloud, but we need to integrate them. Once we had those migration paths, we found that there are many moving parts. Many moving parts that we need to be put together in order to enable the team for DevOps. Building a cloud platform all around Kubernetes means having, for example, secure pipelines designed prior to deploy anything on Kubernetes. We need to create Helm charts for all those monoliths, all those microservices which are coming up. And it also means we had some unplanned challenges. They appeared, felt, it felt like totally randomly. Um, we need to update to Helm version three. That took us, well, several weeks. Um, it was just not easy to make container updates, Helm updates for uh, within a few days. We need weeks and in these weeks, we could not put more effort in the, into feature development or something else. We had to take, mem we had to handle memory leaks um, things that we never had before because op the, the, the uh, customer operations handled those things if they observed that. Speaking of observability, um, the next slide, we put parts together in order to become ready for 24 seven on-call DevOps team. We created alertings. And what we also created with that are immersive logging costs. Our application landscapes uh, well, uh, just uh, that particular one has uh, many, many audit logs. And those audit logs created cost of half a million euros per month. We created life and readiness probes for applications which were never designed for having life and readiness probes because otherwise we could not handle outages, optimize against outages and understand how our applications handle memory or, or cause memory on CPU consumption. All in all, this went very well. It took several years. As of now, we have migrated from a service oriented architecture with a traditional technology stack into event-driven um, architecture with almost resilient systems. That went very well. Let's see about the next project. Currently, we are creating a zero trust cloud platform for, let's say, old fashioned workloads. What's the problem with cloud and old fashioned workloads? You're predominantly doing some lift. You're lifting old applications to the cloud and what you are lifting with them is security vulnerabilities. We need to take care of them. Next slide, please. Just have a short excursion to what are attack vectors and what's that zero trust architecture? What does that mean? We will start with an example. Imagine an application with internet, public internet facing web application based on the Struts2 framework. Struts2 still alive, almost 16 years old with a lot of security vulnerabilities. We know that vulnerabilities because they are stored in a database we just can browse through. It's quite easy to get root access in that Struts2 container, which has been put into Kubernetes cluster. From there, it's quite easy to get the metadata of those instance and probably get root access to those Linux VM. And then which roles to have the most permissions and are secured weak, uh, the most weak um, dev roles. So 
The role of a developer has much permissions probably to access the database and they are very easy to get for, for attack. Next slide, please. Now we see what lateral movement means. We find one weak spot and move to another uh, weak spot. Probably the next spot is our database with customer data. That's then quite interesting. What, um, you can imagine that most of our customers do have something like trust networks. Probably you also have that. Once you're in a network, you're a trusted or authenticated user. That's very bad um, with regards to lateral movement. Creating a zero trust architecture means each, uh, each resource or each asset of, of the architecture needs explicit um, role assignments, authentication, and so on. Assume compromised. That means uh, zero trust architecture. Each resource can be compromised and needs explicitly role assignment. So having that in mind, we are creating a zero trust architecture for our customer. On the next slide, we will see um, what is about the weak technologies. We will put applications on the Kubernetes cluster, which are going to connect to a COBOL monolith, which are going to connect to an Oracle database, probably application with, with Spring Framework, but five to six years old. Docker images were five to six year old. They will come onto a Kubernetes cluster and we will lift security vulnerabilities with them. That means we need to mitigate that risks prior to any Kubernetes related task. Creating role-based access control within the infrastructure, but also within Kubernetes cluster. We need to find insecure deployments, scan automatically uh, for them. In best case, they will not be deployed on the, on the cluster. In worst case, they are deployed and need to be isolated. Put them into a CM, having AI-based tools like Defenders. That are things we need to build around all those Kubernetes cluster. Why, why does this customer even go into cloud? Well, because he wants to modernize his uh, infrastructure. He does not want to have mainframes uh, included. This is the very start of the cloud migration for this customer. Next slide, please. Um, in summary, we recognize that almost all of our projects have a strong focus on enabling teams and enabling teams for security. So Matthias, my question is, what is probably the, the best way to enable teams for Kubernetes adoption curve? Well, thank you. Um, I will. I will try to answer that question and go into that um, right in, in, in a bit. Um, before, before that, first of all, well, thanks. And um, I think it's also very important for our audience to understand and see um, what are the, the business drivers and the business needs um, in which context we get into those engagements and what are all the technologies and, 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 and tools that, that surround um, Kubernetes, which is basically the um the 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 common denominator across all the things that that, that we do there now um it's going a little bit from from business to to technology i mean if, if you look at the stack that 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 Thorsten has already showed i mean this, these were the two that were in there um we have other ones um in this example for like with an, an adoption of kubernetes and ibm cloud with monitoring stacks with instana grafana automation uh, with, with Ansible and, um, and Jenkins. So you can also see there, um, the technology landscape kind of changes. Um, and this kind of re revolves all around that, 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 that Kubernetes piece. And in case you cannot get enough of that, you just take a look here. You most likely you have seen that before. This is the, the, the CNCF landscape. And, and this is the thing that, that we realized um, it, it's not just about adopting Kubernetes, you're pretty much adopting an entire new ecosystem and evaluating and putting the right pieces together to um, make a, a successful um, stack for your uh, successful architecture client is one part that really takes a lot of time and, and hence also money. 
because it's not like there's one single golden combination which will always work. You really, we, have, we found out that a lot of the things we do is evaluating and, and comparing and making sure we, we pick the right tool for the right job, which is a difficult thing because probably at the moment, as we speak, there are five new things popping up to that landscape. What, what we have mentioned before was, of course, um, the observability factor. So this is just one kind of tiny sub landscape within that landscape. And even there, it's almost impossible like to evaluate them all. So um, a lot of experience is, is definitely helpful there, um, but still you need to, to continue learning and, and stay kind of on, on, on top of the curve. So colleagues of ours have actually come up and created a tool called Open APM. It's an open source um, kind of documentation, so to say, um, where like parties can, can contribute to and, and to figure out which technology artifacts would actually work together and, and provide useful combinations of how to collect data, how to like store the data, how to present the data um, of all the monitoring and, and, and logging metrics. So I definitely recommend um, to, to check this out. So yeah, summing things up, um, there's the business side, there's the technology side, um, there's a lot of learning, a lot of things you need to do. And just speaking of learning um, brings me to more, probably the, the final topic here. And Tosn has already asked that. Um, we try to provide training to all of our clients. Sometimes we just do dedicated technology training, but very often we do like training dedicated when we feel the, the need for, for certain um, participants. But for the ISO training, of course, we, we try to prepare people also not only just to, to master Kubernetes, but some of them, of course, also want to go into a direction and get certified. And um, this certification also comes with some implications. I mean, I'm not sure uh, how many of you here are, do have one of those Kubernetes certifications. There's like the application developer, um, the architect, and, and the security specialist. And we're probably closest to the, to the CKAD. And what I, what I took out here what is, is two sample scenarios. So this is like all hands-on and a very good um, certification um, where you have to demonstrate that you are able to handle the API and walk through those steps. Now, looking at the things and say, well, I want to create five Nginx pods, label something like that and label other ones like that, or create a busy box pod and echo a message or whatsoever, will definitely show that you are qualified to, to handle the API. But if I play an unfair role, I could also say, none of my clients has ever asked me to do that. So, I mean, of, of course they haven't, but what I'm trying to say here, these, these, these trainings are very much on an how-to level. Like they, you learn how to do the things, but you don't really learn a lot why you would do the things and um, to apply which and what. Let me give you two examples. Well, what we saw in the past, we saw, we saw, and this is, again, we're not making this up. We just cannot put the, <laughs> the client names onto that. But we, we saw scenarios where, where people were deploying one microservice, a single microservice, like to an entire cluster. They wanted super high availability, which they, of course, got. But it was a very, very underutilized environment, as you can imagine. On the other side, we saw people putting all of their microservices and into all of the containers into one pot. And the, the thing, with, if you like relate to that to that certification questions, like the kubectl API will never complain and say what you're trying to do here is just wrong. I mean, it, it might run, but it might you might not using things correctly. So. One of the things that we do is really try to work on that from a, from a logical example, which makes sense. So we have like a coherent microservice application, or we take pieces out of the client application, do the exercises on them to see how do you trade stateless and stateful things, and how do you do the communication right, and, and, and what is, how do you actually write your application or transform your application so you can take the most of the benefits out of Kubernetes. So not only, of course, you need to focus on the what, but also on, on, on why you would do things that way. Now, this kind of brings all things to an end. I mean, we probably could tell you a lot more stories of, of, of things we encountered here, um, but time is short and maybe we can get in touch uh, about this anytime later on. So I just wanted to, to summarize the, the, the things here for you real quickly. Now, um, 
the first one is, is as I already said, um, if you make a decision of adopting or not adopting Kubernetes, just be aware it's not about Kubernetes it, itself only. You basically will, it will buy you in into an entire ecosystem of new tools and technologies. And it, it's a lot of fun. I mean, and, and it's also, Kubernetes is, is an awesome technology and, and, and um, you can do a lot of things with it that you wouldn't be able to do without it. So, um, the, just our recommendation is to plan and allow yourself enough time to evaluate those things um, because you will probably need it and, and it will also make you more flexible to exchange certain parts um, which make your overall architecture more robust. So there will be, you might going to have decisions about provider options on off-prem container build mechanism, security, APM, logging, tracing, and a lot more. So most of them still relate to traditional IT and would even be there without Kubernetes, but with Kubernetes, the, the, your options will multiply. Then this is probably one of the, of the biggest things is um, it's a lot of fun to play around with the technology, but they, um, it's also dangerous to get stuck into like a, le a level with, where you don't provide business value. In another, or put it in other terms, it's like, don't try to solve problems which have already been solved um, because a lot of tools might already have pulled together the abstraction which might be the right one for you. So uh, my recommendation is don't probably uh, don't build everything from scratch. There is an, a tutorial which is called Kubernetes the hard way, which does that. And there is a reason why this tutorial is called that way. So if you have the choice, use a managed Kubernetes environment. So that enables you to focus on application development and provide the value quickly to your clients. If you cannot use a public cloud provider, still try to use tooling for on-prem Kubernetes deployment management. There are things like Rancho, Kubernetes, Giant Swarm, OpenShift, and so on that that will do, take a lot of things away from you that you would have to do by yourself if you start doing it all from scratch. And in addition to that, and I need to say that because I am a consultant, of course, try to get consultancy um, from people that have experience with it because that experience um, will, will definitely save you some time or stepping into, into too many problems uh, in an unnecessary way. Or also there are distributions that provide a service along. So you can have the possibility to call somebody and get help um, on, on, your, on your journey. Now, about the skills, this is also that we got from basically from feedback from all of our colleagues. Um, invest in the skills of your employees and give them the time to learn. The Kubernetes, I hear very often that Kubernetes has a low, uh, low entry barrier, I don't really agree with that. In, especially in the beginning, I find it particularly hard just to understand all the constructs um, and, and API objects. You need a lot of time to not only learn them, but also learn to apply them. And please combine this with cloud native software engineering aspects because only then you will be able to take the full benefit out. Finally, this might sound pretty logic anyway, don't go all in, uh, make it an like on and off the kind of decision, do POCs, do lighthouse projects, evaluate, get familiar with things, evaluate pros and cons, which will help you uh, again later on the way. So summarizing again, there is no silver bullet. And I'm, I think I'm running slow, slightly over time here. So with that, I wanna say thank you for listening from 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 both of us um we're gonna still we will you probably get our contact details um in in sked so if you want to reach out to us feel free to ping us we're definitely happy to talk about the things more and with that i want to say yeah thank you and bye bye and we open up the line for the room for questions <laughs>